Hello, IPM class. This is Dr. Wenger. This is another lecture that got deleted uh, from my account, so I had to re-record it. So I'm going to give you the short version sitting here in my office. So if you hear birds chirping and the like, it's just because my door is open. So this is the second part of our lecture on safety, uh, safety concerns around pesticides. So in the last lecture, we really focused on how pesticides can impact human health. And this time around, what I'd like to really focus in on are the instances of safety concerns around the environment. So when we're releasing pesticides into the world, we are basically dumping poisons into the natural environment. And so that does have associated concerns, and thus we need to be careful. Now, the main concern here really is that while we can do a lot of work to make sure pesticides are being applied just to plants, Pesticides don't tend to stay there very long. In reality, uh, pesticides will oftentimes uh, wash off of the plants and enter other parts of the environment, whether that's in the atmosphere, and they may drop uh, into other areas or be breathed in. They can enter the soil, where they may sink down to the surface water or run off into the, um, or sorry, sink down into the um, groundwater or run off into the surface water. And this could be any number of problems. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on these three major areas where pesticides go, air, water, and soil, and then we'll talk a little bit about ways uh, that this can be controlled for. So as far as pesticides are in the air, there's really uh, a number of ways that pesticides can enter the atmosphere. One of the most important of which is volatilization. Now, volatilization uh, has the root in volatile, you know, meaning something that can uh, change rapidly, in this case, uh, rapidly turning into a gas. And volatilization is really just that. It's the process of a chemical going from a liquid state to a vaporous state. So, essentially, the process of pesticides evaporating. Now, a pesticide is considered highly volatile when it vaporizes at very low temperatures, so maybe temperatures we typically see in the field. And these vapors can move on the wind, on air flows, uh, or they can just hang out in the uh, general area of the crop, and they can impact organisms in that area or uh, crops that are just outside of them. Now, the major factors that uh, feed into volatility are primarily the chemical structure of the pesticide, as well as a handful of environmental factors. Now, there are some chemistries that just naturally are more volatile than others are. And in some cases, these chemistries are specifically built to be volatile because they are toxic by being breathed in. This is kind of the whole, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this is generally the basis behind um, uh, fumigation techniques that you want it to be inhaled. And so these chemicals just naturally are vaporous and need to be uh, applied in very specific ways to avoid their spread. On the other hand, there are environmental factors that can cause these chemicals to uh, become more volatile. And in general, it's kind of what you would expect. If you have higher temperatures and more wind, you're going to see increases in volatility, whereas volatility increases as humidity decreases. So basically, if there's not a whole lot of water in the air and it's pretty hot and windy, you're going to get a whole lot of loss of your pesticide through volatilization. Now, amongst the volatile compounds, the ones that are of particular interest and concern are the volatile organic compounds. Now, these are organic compounds where the vapors interact with sunlight to produce nitrogen oxides. Now, why nitrogen oxides matter is that they can combine with uh, various compounds in the, in the atmosphere to produce either rain acidification, which is a bit more of a big deal on the East Coast than it is over here, but also that they can form ozone, creating smog, which is a respiratory irritant. And as such, VOCs are widely regulated by the California Department of Pesticide Regulation in order to avoid air pollution. Now, general policies excuse me, to avoid volatilization are more or less to avoid those environmental conditions that are going to cause the chemical to be volatile. So generally applying at night when it's less hot, there's less wind, and you have much higher humidity. Similarly, by applying underneath tarps or using techniques that force you to incorporate 
um, the chemical into the soil, you can really avoid a lot of volatility. Aside from volatility, probably the most obvious way that pesticides can move through the air is through drift. The idea that a pesticide is generally a, a spray within water or some sort of dust, uh, you want it to be light so that it distributes well through the crop, and of course if it's a little windy, uh, those fine particles can be distributed out of the spray site and into neighboring areas. Which is kind of a double whammy, because on one hand, you're getting less of the chemical in your field, so you're getting a lower dose, but you're also causing a lot of environmental contamination. And in general, the trend we see is that when you have high temperatures and wind, along with low humidity, we have more drift. So the same sort of conditions that cause higher volatility also lead to greater drift. And as such, a lot of the things we do to avoid drift are going to be the same. Um, applying at night, finding ways to trap pesticides within a certain location. Now drift oftentimes isn't a huge problem because if you apply under normal conditions when there's not very much wind, we expect that um, concentrated batches of particles that are in the air are going to spread out slowly. They're going to sort of disperse from a site uh, and sort of uh, dilute out enough that they don't cause a problem. Uh, we call that dilution is the solution to pollution. Now, where drift can be a big problem is when you have something called an inversion layer. So, under an inversion layer, we have a pocket of cold air that is trapped against the surface of the Earth, and then we have warm air floating somewhere between 20 and 100 feet above the surface of the Earth. Now, normally, if you... Uh, so excuse me, so warm air rises, right? So essentially, under normal conditions, warm air is down near the ground because the earth is hot, and so uh, it's going to rise up into the cool air above. Whereas, under these conditions, with warm air up top and cooler near the bottom, there's no reason for these air layers to mix. So when the pesticide is sprayed, it may rise up into the atmosphere, but it's gonna get trapped at this sort of inversion between the two and thus can form a highly dense cloud. And if it's a little windy, this cloud will travel and eventually drop down onto uh, some other location at a high dose, which can be extremely problematic if it lands on a crop that's about to be harvested, giving it a dose of a pesticide, increasing residues. Maybe it lands on a crop that it's not registered for. Or maybe the pesticide you're spraying isn't a pesticide, maybe you're spraying a defoliant, and all of a sudden you're defoliating someone's crop. So as far as avoiding drift is concerned, a large part of it is, well, on, like I said earlier, avoiding those conditions that cause volatility as well. You don't want to spray when it's windy. You don't want to spray when it's too hot. So oftentimes it's recommended you spray at night. Likewise, a lot of the other stuff is focused around really making it hard for the drops of pesticide to stay in the air. So using application techniques that produce larger drops, using high spray pressures, or sorry, using low spray pressures to increase that drop size, and also just decreasing the distance between your spray nozzle and the plant so that you are more directly applying the chemicals. And then finally, the dust-borne particles are something worth considering. Not the hugest source, uh, most huge source of pesticides, but essentially this is the process in which pesticides uh, adhere to dust on the ground and so when it gets windy or you drive your truck through a field, you kick up the dust, and the dust transports the uh, pesticide on it. And so generally, this can be minimized first off by avoiding dust formulations, which kind of just hang out on the ground and be kicked up easily, but also by integrating the pesticides into the soil uh, using some things like irrigation so that it sinks further in using mechanical techniques as well. So that's more or less it for pollution in the air. That generally you're looking at drift and volatility with a certain amount of dust uh, persistence as well. And the main concerns with the air are going to be around the pesticide trans being transported to a location where you don't want it. Now on the other hand, we have water contamination. And water contamination is a little bit more nefarious. Uh, because once contaminated, you can't really use water for a whole lot of anything. 
Uh, you can't use it for drinking. You can't use it on certain crops. It just makes things more challenging. And so as far as water contamination is concerned, there really are a large part of what contaminates water comes down to the actual chemical structure of the pesticide and some key factors to how it interacts in the environment. The first of which is the chemical's persistence. And this is kind of obvious, but the general idea is that the longer the pesticide's half-life is, the more likely it is to turn up in water. And this is because it can move further from the spray site through water before it actually, before breaking down. So if you have, say, a chemical that has a half-life of seven days versus a chemical with a half-life of 21 days, you know, after seven days, the first chemical is pretty well broken down. If there aren't any, like, rain events or irrigation events in that time, then for the most part, it's all broken down before it actually gets moved anywhere in the water. But if something is around for 21 days before it's broken down halfway, there's a three times greater chance that there's been some sort of rain event, maybe the grower's irrigated, maybe they've sprayed another chemical, and all of those give opportunities to move the chemical through the soil or across as runoff and having it enter some sort of water source. Beyond that, the chemical and how it adsorbs to soil matters as well. So soil adsorption is the tendency of a chemical to bind to the soil. And generally, generally there are negatives, there are negatives associated with having high adsorption and with low adsorption. So if a chemical has low adsorption, meaning it does not bind to soil, then it's more likely that it will leach through the soil column and eventually end up in the groundwater because there's nothing slowing it down. It just rides with the water. If it has high adsorption, though, you get the case where oftentimes it'll stick to the soil, and when there's a rain event, it'll get washed away, enter a river or a, um, a, a pond, a ditch, whatever, uh, attached to the actual sediment. So normally, when they're designing chemicals for pesticide applications, you want a chemical structure that is somewhere between these two. Something that binds to the soil tightly enough that it doesn't sink into the groundwater, but not so tightly that it gets washed into the, uh, that it'll stick on the soil for a long period of time. And then finally, there's a concern of water solubility. And a lot of the concerns of water solubility are similar to those of soil adsorption. It's just about how far does the chemical move in the water column. So solubility is just how well the pesticide dissolves into water. And we see the same sort of idea. Chemicals that are highly soluble, those that do well in water, tend to leach through the soil, and again, those with low solubility tend to remain near the surface. So the main problem here is just chemicals that really like to be in water. Now, when we talk about water contamination, much like, most, much like other forms of contamination, we're generally talking about accidental introduction. Uh, typically, you spray, and there's some sort of drift event or runoff or leaching. Uh, and again, not leaching, sorry, drift or runoff. Again, we're just talking about surface. And this is because it is illegal to apply pesticides, pesticides directly to surface water. So, you know, when it shows up, it generally has to be because it somehow got there accidentally. And generally in the San Joaquin Valley, what we see is that you don't have a ton of uh, contamination of water except around precipitation and irrigation events in which you are washing pesticides off of fields and into these water sources. And generally this is going to be, again, uh, things like dormant sprays during the winter where you have a whole bunch of chemical out there and also chance rain events, but also overflow from irrigation in treated fields. Now, to avoid the surface water contamination, typically what we do is you just try to avoid applying pesticides before a precipitation event. So, you know, if you know it's mostly in runoff, avoid situations in which chemicals are going to run off. But this can be challenging, because in a lot of ways, uh, these precipitation events are the exact sort of time when we want to apply pesticides. Think of things like bloom sprays. You want to apply a spray to avoid fungal pathogens uh, knocking your flowers off the tree? Well, you have to spray right before the uh, rainstorm because that's when the fungal pathogens are most likely to cause damage. 
Um, again, another recommendation is to retain the contaminated irrigation water in some sort of holding area until the label recommended release date. So if you apply irrigation to a spray field, you have to hold that water until you've had enough half-life passes that you can uh, release it into the main water bodies. And then finally, the idea that you want to maintain some buffer strips of vegetation between fields and surface water. So what this is, is essentially you have a field, say like right here you've got a field, you've got a body of water over here, you leave a certain area in between the field and that body of water as a riparian zone that has uh, some wild vegetation in it. And what this does is it slows down the water flowing from the field to the water, and it also allows uh, a lot of that water to be absorbed into the ground before getting into the surface water. Now, groundwater contamination tends to happen two major ways. The first of which is direct entry. This is essentially accidental contamination through any sort of cracks, abandoned wells, irrigation systems, um, irrigation that don't have backflow protection. Essentially, any sort of system in which the chemical is directly linked through a hole in the ground to the groundwater. So this would be like if you were, uh, in the example here, you're putting some pesticide and you're uh, filling up a pesticide tank using a pump, but you've got a leak, that leak spreads and eventually feeds through a crack at the base of the well, follows the pipe down to the groundwater where it directly contaminates the groundwater. On the flip side, there is leaching. Leaching being natural movement downward of pesticides through the soil. And this is really where that soil absorption and water solubility matters most, right? That those that are highly soluble and have low absorption, they're going to leach fast. Now, leaching is generally what we call a non-point source of pollution, right? So a non-point source of pollution means that the pesticides enter the groundwater through the normal application of fields. So essentially, growers go out, they spray their fields, right, uh, with their like blast sprayer in this case. You have periodic rain events and irrigation events, and through that, the little uh, pesticide particles enter the soil and just slowly work their way down into the groundwater. Now, this is not just one grower's problem. This is typically a large number of growers. They're not doing anything that's against the rules. It's just the fact that you have so many pesticides in the system that eventually some of them are going to make it in. So you can't go to an individual location and say, this is where the contamination happened. It's happening everywhere. So that's non-point. You can't, well, let me say that later. On the flip side, Pesticides can enter the groundwater through point source pollution, and this would be a little bit more like this direct entry we were talking about. The idea that at some point a chemical has been mishandled, improperly disposed of, or there are poorly regulated storage facilities in which a large amount of the chemical was somehow leaked into the soil or through a well or was dumped directly into a water source and it entered in high concentrations and caused the pollution event there. So kind of the way I think of a point source versus a non-point source is that a point source is a large quantity at a very specific location. So I can go somewhere, like in this example, and I can point at those barrels lying on the ground and say, that is where the pollution happened. This is where the contamination occurred. So I'm pointing at the source. With a non-point source, I can't necessarily point to a single location and say, this is where it happened, because it's well spread out, so I cannot point at the source. All right. So, as far as water contamination is concerned, the real key factors to what ends up... I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. So... As far as contamination of water, whether it's surface or ground, there are a large number of things that can have some sort of shape to this. Um, various agricultural practices, when you apply the pesticide, how frequently you do it, the type of irrigation you have, as well as the geological conditions, whether you have a high slope, which is going to cause lots of runoff, uh, if you have a soil type that allows leaching. Those both matter. They are going to have some influence on groundwater contamination. 
But generally what you find is that most important of all is the property of the pesticide. The idea that um, how soluble, um, how much soil absorption there is, the level of persistence, these are all the things that are going to determine which chemicals end up in the water versus others. And so to avoid contamination in water, the real secret is just avoid chemicals that have these properties. So many chemicals that have these properties are listed as known groundwater contaminators. This will be on the, um, this will oftentimes be on the label, or if you're in an area where there are known groundwater contamination problems, they'll have regional bans on certain pesticides. Uh, another way to avoid is to, uh, as we mentioned earlier, just avoid irrigating directly after an application. And if you're working in sandy soils where you have low uh, organic matter, you're not going to get a whole lot of, um, you're not going to end up with a whole lot of uh, soil absorption. Avoid chemicals that tend to be leachable. So as far as runoff is concerned and um, groundwater contamination, Really, well, runoff in any sort of water contamination. This is really more of a problem in the dry land farming regions of the United States. So those areas that are mostly rain-fed as opposed to irrigated. So we're talking the upper Midwest, the Mississippi Delta, and uh, parts of the East Coast. So these are areas where we're predominantly growing row crops uh, and where farmers are dependent on regular rainfall over the course of a growing season. And as such, the ground gets pounded with water at sort of uh, unpredictable rates, and thus more pesticide flow runoff is expected. On the flip side, if you look at the West, where we don't get a lot of regular summer rainfall, we just do not see these problems. Except for, surprise, surprise, the San Joaquin Valley. And why is this? Well, the major reason for the uh, upper, the increased levels of um, Runoff with pesticide in it in the San Joaquin has a lot to do with how many orchard crops we grow and how dependent we are on dormant sprays and bloom sprays to protect our crops. Thus, we tend to have very significant levels of pesticide application during our rainiest part of the season, thus increasing the dangers of runoff. And this can be fairly obvious when you look at some of the stats. Um, this was a, a study where they looked at diaz, diazinon uh, rates inside water sources. So this is surface water measures, uh, discharge within the river. So essentially, let me get, I mean, add myself. So what we have on this chart is the month and year. And within each month, they have data points looking at the discharge of the river in green, so the higher the discharge, the more water was entering the river. It can be thought of as precipitation events. And then in red, we had the concentration of diazinon, uh, this organophosphate that was used during dormant sprays in orchards. And the general trend we see is that when flow rates are low, so this would be cases where the flow in the river is mostly due to releases from the dams, uh, you have very low diazinon concentrations. But diazinon concentrations in the rivers tend to spike at the same time that our water flow spikes. And this is due to rain events. Rain causes more water to enter the river, causing the spike in discharge, but it also washes off the diazinon during the dormant sprays, thus increasing the amount of diazinon we have in the system. And so we see these sort of coinciding peaks over and over again. It's just very interesting. Um, now, d chemicals during these dormant sprays can also cause trouble through uh, direct contact. This is just a little uh, study that found that more or less dor dormant sprays of various pesticides, primarily parathion, was causing mortality in red-tailed hawks because they would land on the branches and absorb a little bit of the chemical through their foot pads. And by absorbing a little bit over and over and over again, they eventually got a lethal dose and they would die out of the population. Thus, with the ban on, well, with the loss of popularity in parathion, we've actually seen a bounce back in our hawk populations in the last couple of years. So as far as groundwater contamination in, in California is concerned, it's 
um, kind of on the unfortunate side of common. There's a fair bit going on. Uh, but the general trend is that while there is a fair bit of it going on, it tends to be caused by a very small number of pesticides. Those pesticides that have those characteristics I talked about earlier. High solubility, long half-lives, and uh, low absorption. And this was really bore out in a study back in 2008 where they sampled about 3,700 wells in California and tested them for pesticide contamination. About 10% of total wells were found to have uh, high levels of contamination. And of these, what they really found was that the majority of them, almost three quarters, were contaminated by eight pesticides. These were really the ones that made up the vast majority of contamination cases. And thus, by avoiding these particular uh, chemistries, you can really reduce your chances of um, uh, groundwater contamination. All right, so soil. Now, soil, it's pretty clear how pesticides get into soil. More or less, a lot of the pesticide we spray just ends up in the soil through direct application. It doesn't land on a plant. Instead, the little droplet of water with the pesticide in it ends up on the ground and thus gets absorbed into the soil. And as such, um, soil oftentimes, um, well, I guess, and alternatively, soil can also absorb a lot of runoff from the plants during irrigation of rain events. And as such, soil primarily acts as a reservoir for pesticides, just holding on to them until they enter some other part of the environment. And as such, persistent pesticides that are more likely to hang out in the soil for long periods of time are more likely to end up entering some sort of plant, an invertebrate, the air, or the water. And generally, the type of soil you have can really influence how long the pesticide stays there and in what direction it moves. That generally, organic matter has a lot of clay. Uh, well, so soils with a lot of clay, a lot of organic matter, they're going to bind pesticides very tightly. And as such, they're more likely to persist, but also less likely to move. Whereas systems where you have a lot of water or sandy soils, you're going to have more leaching. So this is the general trend as far as how pesticides move within the soil. Generally, once they are in the soil, um, they can either be adsorbed or dissolved, meaning they either enter the water or they stick to the soil. When they enter the water, they can either be picked up by the plant and actually enter the system it was supposed to. Uh, once they're in the plant, you know, they may, well, I can get ahead of myself. So they can enter the plant. If they're dissolved, they can always leach through the water down to the water table. Uh, alternatively, they can uh, be uh, picked up by various invertebrates. They can decompose due to chemical processes. Uh, biological processes, or in some cases they can be volatilized, volatilized, volatilized directly out of the soil into the air. Uh, beyond that, sometimes they can leave the site directly attached to the soil, either by being soil stuck onto some sort of produce, or as runoff during a rain event. Hmm. So. Within the environment, as I mentioned just a minute ago, a lot of pesticides, though, do not persist long enough in the environment to actually cause any sort of significant damage. Uh, they break down before they ever get into the groundwater, surface water, or get inhaled or eaten or whatever. And this is a purposeful design for many pesticides, that they want to have this low persistence. So one of the primary ways they break down... Excuse me. And we generally call this process transformation, or just the breakdown of pesticides into degradation processes. And typically, pesticides get broken down into a wide variety of byproducts. And the hope is that when they break down, they will become less toxic and less persistent than the original. But this is not always the case. Some of them can be more toxic and persistent. Uh, one example of this that was problematic was the use of methylparathion, in uh, rice patties. This is an insecticide, and for a long time they used it in uh, sort of Sacramento County, well, sorry, more like Sacramento Valley rice growers used it to control pests or pest insects. And they would 
Uh, after they sprayed it, they would hold the water in the paddy for a while and eventually release it, and it would flow down to the Sacramento River. And they were monitoring the river for methylparathion levels to see how much of it was getting introduced, and it looked like uh, it was mostly being dissolved during the holding phase, so everything was safe. But as it worked out, they eventually expanded the test to search for a lot of the byproducts, and they found out that they were actually releasing large concentrations of paranitrophenol, which was one of the breakdown products, and was actually significantly more toxic to aquatic life than methylparathion was. So they had to end up increasing the amount of time held in reservoir uh, in order to thoroughly break down this byproduct. Now, major forms of transformation include hydrolysis. This is when the chemical actually directly reacts with water in such a way that it gets broken down into small water-soluble segments, which is typically how organophosphates and carbamates break down, common pesticides. There's photodegradation, which is the exposure to light causes pesticides to break down, now, I put occurs only in a few pesticides, but I don't know. A lot of the newer pesticides are actually very um, very susceptible to photodegradation, especially a lot of the new biologicals like Bt. There's oxidation reduction. So this would be interactions um, that cause electrons to be either attached to or removed uh, from the chemical itself usually requiring an oxidizer and, a, and or a reducing chemical to come along and interact with it. And finally, there's microbial degradation. Or in other words, the process of microbes in the soil digesting the pesticides um, using their enzymes, and thus producing less harmful products. And generally, microbial degradation is going to be more important in areas where you have lots of microbes that can live in the soil. So areas that have moist, warm, well-aerated soils. Now, hmm. impacts on non-targets. So something we need to consider whenever we are applying pesticides is any potential route in which a non-target organism may be exposed to the pesticide. Now these non-targets may include natural organisms, well, wild organisms, so things like fish, birds, um, plants, uh, soil microbes, etc., but they also can uh, be human beings. There's always the chance that through our exposure in the environment, we may uh, have some sort of drift into a residential area, or we may contaminate something that is going to market. And generally, we can target, or we can group exposures into two major categories. Direct exposure, in other words, where you directly contact the actual pesticide, whether it drifts onto you or you touch a piece of plant that's contaminated, or indirect exposure through residues that are left on uh, actual agricultural products. Now, one of the biggest challenges we face in terms of protecting non-targets is the fact that oftentimes even with the best laid plans to reduce the dosages of pesticides in the environment, we can still run into situations where organisms get a lethal dose uh, from that really low concentration. And generally this occurs through the process of bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation is just the process in which pesticides gradually build up within the tissues of living organisms after feeding on other organisms containing smaller amounts of the pesticide. So the idea here is that if you are consuming a pesticide directly from the environment, if that pesticide is at very, very low dosages, then if you feed on it, then you're only going to get a very small amount of that dose. So let's say you're a little fish swimming in a pond. We have some runoff of a, um, a, um, an herbicide that is toxic to fish at high doses, but at low doses doesn't really cause much trouble. So the herbicide floats in, it gets picked up by some of the, um, alga, the algae, uh, some of the aquatic plants. You're a small fish, you eat those plants, and so you absorb a little bit of that herbicide. Now the dose is so low that you're perfectly fine. You know, you've got maybe one thousandth of a lethal dose. 
Now the fish that's next up the food chain eats you, the little fish. And eating one little fish isn't really enough to satisfy the bigger fish, so they might eat, say, ten little fish instead of eating one. And every time they eat one of those little fish, they're absorbing the dose of herbicide that those little fish had. So they're eating ten little fish that each have one one-thousandth of a lethal dose, and so it's getting, say, ten thousandths of a lethal dose, or one one-hundredth. You multiply that up the chain, if this next bigger fish eats ten fish of that medium size, it's getting um, ten doses at one one-hundredth, or in other words, they're getting one-tenth of a lethal dose. And then if the very biggest fish eats ten of those fish, it's going to get ten-tenths of a lethal dose, or one actual lethal dose. And this is the level where you start seeing these lethal effects. It's at the very top of the food chain. And so the dangers of pesticides can be sneaky. Even though everything seems above board, the contaminants can build up as they climb the food chain just because of the sort of the general trend that to be a top-level predator, you have to have eaten a lot of things further down the food chain. Now, one final thing I want to bring up is just sort of a, uh, an interesting trend that's been emerging lately, which is the process of androgenization. So this is the idea that pesticides may appear to be perfectly harmless when exposed in relatively high doses to non-target organisms. But then it turns out that these pesticides are having a uh, substantial effect on the pest physiology that is not obvious or detectable in the short run. In the case of androgenization, these pesticides oftentimes will mimic or interfere with the production of hormones in these animals, causing them to have a, sort of a loss or a uh, mix-up of sexual characteristics, hence androgenization, the process of um, having an indistinct sex. A good example of this was with atrazine. This is an herbicide that used to be uh, really the most widely applied herbicide in the world. It's a known ground contaminant, and uh, it was demonstrated that it actually interferes with testosterone production and estrogen, testosterone and estrogen production in frogs, such that when uh, frogs were exposed to atrazine, they saw a 75% reduction in sperm in male frogs, and they found that male frogs, if exposed at a... Um, uh, immature life stage before they reach sexual maturity, about 10% of those male frogs would actually develop into biological females because their uh, testosterone levels were so low. Similarly, they did an experiment where they raised tadpoles in water that had very small, just bare trace atrazine levels in it, similar to those found in the environment. And they found that at these low concentrations, one part per billion, that is infinitesimal, that is one-tenth of a billionth. They found that by uh, basically raising them in there, they saw these same sort of levels. Lack of sperm, uh, large, a significant portion of male frogs becoming biological females. And uh, finally, one last thing to consider in terms of pesticide use is that in certain regions, the uh, use of certain pesticides is highly restricted because of the presence of endangered species. Now, a label will tell you if there are any restrictions associated with endangered species, but it's your responsibility as the applicator or as the person making the recommendation to know if there are any endangered species around and whether or not you should apply a specific chemical. Luckily, lots of software such as Agrian and the like will trace this for you. So you're somewhat taken care of. All right, that's what I've got for you. Thanks for listening.